In a world in which digital platforms are collecting and processing large amounts of information about consumers, protecting consumer privacy has become a hot topic. The General Data Protection Regulation, which the European Union adopted in 2018, has been hailed as an important piece of regulation protecting the personal information about European consumers. But what has been the actual effect of the GDPR? What does the data tell us? Today, let's talk to Tobias Salz about his recent paper, The Effect of Privacy Regulation on the Data Industry, Empirical Evidence from the GDPR. Tobias is an assistant professor of economics at MIT and has co-authored this paper with Guy Aridor and Jon Koche from Columbia. Welcome, Tobias. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan. It's a pleasure to, to be invited and of course a pleasure to discuss my work. So, as the title of our paper suggests, we empirically investigate the effect of GDPR. For our study, we use data from an advertising intermediary who caters to online travel companies. We rely on quasi-experimental methods, meaning that we try to make a case that our results show the causal effect of GDPR on certain outcomes of interest. Now, what is really great about our setting is that we can follow the entire production chain, if you may call it that way, of a sophisticated data-reliant company whose core business revolves around machine learning-based predictions and advertisement. We can see how this firm was affected in terms of access to consumer data, how its ability to track consumers was affected, and how that in turn had an impact on predictions and the ability to serve advertising. So let me give you a brief overview uh, of our results. We find that as a result of GDPR, the firm observes fewer consumers. The effect size corresponds roughly to a 10% reduction in the number of consumers. Now that reduction translates into a mechanical drop in revenues from those consumers. The firm cannot serve advertising to consumers who choose not to share their data with the company. Now, interestingly, we find that there's an offsetting effect. We find that the price that advertisers are willing to pay for the remaining consumers has increased. We hypothesize that this is related to a second interesting observation that we make, which is that consumers that do consent to data sharing um, I mean, once GDPR comes into effect, are trackable for a longer period of time. Our explanation is that because these consumers are easier to track, they're also more valuable to advertisers. Now, what we are very excited about is that we can also look at the causal effect of a law like GDPR on the ability to predict whether consumers uh, are purchasing or not. So we find that GDPR had no impact on the ability to predict consumer behavior. So to the extent that there was a hope that consumers become less predictable because of privacy regulation, those hopes are, at least in our setting, disappointed. I think I have a few questions about the paper. So the first question is about the data you're using. So the data you're using comes from an intermediary that contracts with online travel agencies. And I think this is a great feature of the paper because it enables you to uh, you know, provide a very detailed insight into a particular industry and how you know, the GDPR has played out in that industry. But of course, you know, this, uh, this is a particular industry and so one is wondering um, you know, to what extent your results translate potentially to other industries that have also been affected by the GDPR. Yes, uh, you point at an important trade-off. So, of course, on the one hand, we would like to study one uh, particular setting in depth um, to get all the institutional details right and really drill down to the mechanism. On the other hand, of course, for policy, we would like to be able to generalize. And there's a tension between these two goals. So, so my sense is that in terms of the consumer-facing side, our setting is quite diverse with many different websites 
that have many different interfaces and ways of designing the opt-in mechanism. So on, on, on that side, I'm less worried in terms of generalization. However, there are aspects of our setting that are idiosyncratic. For instance, changing, uh, changes in advertising prices will both depend on how you run the auctions, that is how you design the marketplace and what types of advertising we're talking about. We look at keyword search advertising, but our results, uh, I think, will not generalize to something like behaviorally targeted advertising. So I do believe we have a lot more work to do to study how GDPR has differentially affected different firms in different industries and settings. Um, I also believe that we have to become more representative in terms of the time horizon that we are looking at. So currently, um, most empirical studies have, you know, out of necessity, a rather short time horizon. But of course, you could imagine that they're long-run adjustments. <clears throat> now, this is not to say that these short-run studies are not valuable. They point us towards likely adjustments in the long run. But I think we need to see um, other studies that really look at the long run effect. So another question I have is um, about a novel form of externality that you're you know, referring to in the paper. So the, you know, if there's a privacy conscious consumer who decides to de facto opt out of cookies, this may make the behavior by other consumers uh, more predictable. And so could, you, so could you elaborate a bit on this um, externality? And I found it interesting because um, I was wondering how this affects the you know, conceptualization of a, a privacy right, which is often thought of as an individualist, individualistic right. And now you're referring to you know, connections between one consumer to another consumer. Yes, uh, absolutely. I, I think there's a great question. So I, I guess the core idea is that the opt-out decision itself contains information about you. If you're somebody who takes privacy very seriously, that might correlate with unobserved traits or behavior. In this instance, we believe that consumers who deny consent are the ones who are also more likely to use other means prior to GDPR to protect their privacy. So this goes a bit into the weeds, but basically to the firm, the use of those other privacy means make you appear as many kind of short-lived, bogus consumers. However, there might be some genuinely short-lived consumer spells simply because you know, consumers just don't visit the website that often. The firm would very much like for predictive purposes to tell these uh, two types of consumers apart, but it can't. Now GDPR comes into effect and the artificial short consumer spells <clears throat> are disproportionately leaving the data set because they're coming from consumers who now make use of opt-out. So that's the idea. So now to the second part uh, of your question. This is a great point, and it highlights an important distinction, which is between intrinsic, uh, the intrinsic and the instrumental value of privacy. So let me try to make a, an analogy to a health setting, which is not unfortunately too far from the truth. Suppose I have some health condition. According to the intrinsic privacy motive, I might prefer not to share details about that health status per se, because I simply would like no one to know about it. According to an instrumental privacy motive, I might prefer not to share things about this health status because it protects me from premium increases by my health insurer. Now suppose everybody who is healthy starts to wear a Fitbit or an Apple Watch and agrees to share this data with health insurance companies. They can now credibly signal to the insurer that they're healthy. So under this scenario, it does not matter that I do decide not to share my data. data. The insurer can infer my health start status regardless because other people have decided to share their data. I think this example illustrates that from a regulatory perspective, both motives are important and their privacy externalities play an important role. So I think another question I have is about, you know, the 
welfare implications um, um, of uh, the setup you're looking into. So in the paper, you mentioned that you do not engage in a full welfare analysis of, you know, what this means for consumers and for advertisers. And so I'm wondering, you know, what this um, means for, you know, potential policy conclusions that one could draw from your paper and what could be next steps to get closer to a full kind of welfare assessment? Yeah, so, so what I believe our paper does is it suggests that, that privacy externalities are real, although uh, in our setting they manifest in a much more benign way than I would, what I just described to you in the example. However, I think it illustrates an, an, an important point, namely that you know, we have to take into account these kinds of spillovers. Now, um, you know, these are qualitative results, but ultimately we would really like to learn something about uh, welfare. And I think that there are three important components uh, to a welfare quantification. The first is any change in the product value due to G GDPR, which in our case is advertising. The second is the cost for firms to be comp compliant with the law. So these could be one-time fixed costs, but there could also be ongoing recurring costs for data protection officers and so on. The third is the benefit that GDPR provides to consumers or any nuisance that it causes. Now we have these three components. I think I've listed them in increasing order of difficulty to really get at them. Okay? The first in our setting is straightforward. My field, which is empirical industrial organization, has established econometric tools that allow you to measure the underlying value of bidders based on observed bids in the auctions. So that basically allows you to get at the welfare of the consumers, uh, which in ca this case are the advertisers. From that we can, um, so from, from similar uh, tools for um, um, decisions in, in the marketplace, we might also be able to indirectly get at the compliance cost, or we might simply use a direct measure of compliance cost. So that should take care of the second point. Now the third point is, is really hard. What is the value of consumers um, what, what is the value of GDPR to consumers? That has so many facets that I'm not sure we'll be able to uh, talk about all of them in, in the short amount of time that we have. But we just touched on one of them, which is that um, you know, consumers might value different things about privacy. They might have intrinsic privacy motives, or they might value privacy because of its instrumental value. Moreover, their externalities, so you know, their own decisions might not necessarily be sufficient. Um, so I think that the other um, point that's important to keep in mind here is that you know we, we cannot necessarily rely on the fact that consumers make informed uh, and very um, um, conscious decisions when they at uh, when they act in these kinds of markets and let's say click on uh, consent banners uh, to share their data. So to the extent that we oftentimes use tools to infer something about the value from market behavior. I think it, there's a challenge here in that you know it's not clear under which conditions consumers make those decisions and what kinds of things they're taking into account. So I think there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done to really get at uh, the consumer's value of privacy, possibly through a combination of surveys and other uh, new econometric tools that that help us understand um, what those decisions are. Great. So I think, unfortunately, we are uh, running out of time. This brings us to the end of this episode. I wanted to uh, thank Tobias a lot for being, us, uh, for being with us today. And we're looking forward to your next pieces of research. And I wanted to thank all of you for uh, listening today and hope you will join us for another episode soon. Thank you, thank you Stefan. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks. <laughs>